Hello, uh, welcome everyone to this very special edition of Virtual Library Laureates, brought to you by Friends of the San Francisco Public Laureate uh, Library, uh, your nonprofit library support organization. Um, I am Marie Cipella, Friends of the San Fr uh, ED of the Friends of the Library, and um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight, and especially to those of you who bought tickets to support our mission for a free and equitable public library. Um, so Friends is li uh, pretty famous for its annual event called Library Laureates, featuring authors throughout the Bay Area who gather at our main library to dine and talk about books. Our virtual edition continues this tradition which, with greater reach through events uh, that can now attract audiences throughout the city and even across the country. Tonight is a very unique event uh, for library laureates celebrating the literature of running. We're joined by two authors who share humorous autobiographies about their discoveries of the joys of running in very interesting ways. This event was conceived by and will be hosted by one of our friends board members, Matthew Keniston. So I'm gonna let Matthew uh, explain what's gonna happen tonight and take it away. Matt? Hi, my name is Matt Keniston. I currently serve on the board of the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library with 15 amazing colleagues. On behalf of us all, welcome. My love affair with libraries began over 40 years ago at the old Nichols Library in Naperville, Illinois. San Francisco has been my home since 1999 and our terrific San Francisco Public Library has introduced me to countless new stories and community events. Tonight, I'm extraordinarily privileged to introduce Peter Sagel and Christopher McDougall to our audience. This wouldn't be possible without their generous allocation of time in support of friends of the San Francisco Public Library or their appreciation of each other's work. Running with Sherman by Christopher McDougall was my most recommended book of 2020. The story of Sherman rescued from a hoarder's barn and nursed to health made me laugh, cry, and cheer out loud. People familiar with Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me may recognize Peter Sagel as the host of the popular NPR weekly quiz program. He's also the author of The Incomplete Book of Running, an honest and insightful memoir and humorous riff on James Fix's 1977, The Complete Book of Running. Between them, Peter and Chris have sold millions of books about running, but their books are really about so much more. Their stories are about community, vulnerability, perseverance, pushing limits, the triumph of spirit, and the tragedy of imperfection. During our conversation tonight, our audience can pose questions in the Q&A feature, and these will be taken at the end as time permits, and the chat will be open. We welcome participation. Finally, I'm excited to share that we'll conduct a raffle at the end of the event for Peter to record his voice on your voicemail. So without further ado, Christopher McDougall and Peter Sagel, all right. Thank you, Matthew. Hey, Matthew, I will kick in $100 right now if you pick up that ukulele and play a 10-second song. Uh, I don't want... No, we'll Dude, do it at the end. We'll do it at the I'll, end. I'll give you 200 if you pick up the banjo. Oh, okay. Well, I think it's 300 in total, right? Yeah, I know. All right. And that way you keep an eye on... I think we'll go for the ukulele. <laughs> oh, you just, just cut by 50% the entire donation. I know. I what that's this is I'm better at this one. Yeah. Come on, man. He didn't say it'd be good on the banjo. Just strum it. I'll get you two hundred dollars. No, I I I I think I require some sort of recognizable tune. But keep in mind, Chris, he just said he's better in the ukulele, so maybe we should leave it here. Oh, all right. Hey, uh, I'm serious. I'll send a hundred bucks in uh, through the donation board. And before we even start, let me throw one more thing out there too. anybody else who kicks in a hundred dollars. 
I got a banging running with Sherman running t-shirt. It's a sleeveless performance tee. It's got a donkey on the front. Anybody else who kicks in a hundred, you'll have to figure out who that person is, Matthew, but um, I will send them that person that shirt. Are you modeling it right now, Chris? No, I was going to, um, but I felt like it's pride month and I had to go, I had to go ally instead of self-promotion. I understand. I had to go whatever was lying at the top of my drawer. That was my gesture of yeah. solidarity with my <laughs> laundry. Drawer. Yeah, exactly. So, yes. Anyway, hello, everybody. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Peter. I'm, I'm talking. No, to I, was, I was about to say this is very exciting because uh, like everybody else, I assume I've, I've read Chris's books um, and I've never actually had a chance to talk to him, even though we have a, a number of things in common. We're around the same age. We both went to college somewhere near Boston at around the same time. Uh, and we've both written books on running, which, as I said on Twitter, and Matthew apparently repeated sincerely, between the two of us, we've sold millions of copies, which is true. Um, so I'm actually kind of excited because I've, I've always wanted to talk to you, and now I get a chance. It, 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 who cares if people are watching? Well, me too. But I, again, I feel because of the wonders of social media, I feel like I do know you, you know, uh, that's one of the beauties of Twitter is that you get to see that kind of personal side of people. And also my wife went out to see you in Philadelphia. No, really? In an outdoor show and dude came back just like floating like Sleeping Beauty on butterflies and hearts, man. She loved the show, was just blown away. I'm, given what I just read about your 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 wife, Mika, Mika, yes, in, in uh, Running with Sherman, I'm extremely flattered because she comes across extremely well in that book. She is wonderful, and uh, which reflects highly on you. But the second thing is, and again, I was not teasing you at all today. I bumped into a friend. I think she's actually online for today. I know her son is. Yeah. And, my son is Zeke, actually, from Running with Sherman. Oh, of course, yes. I haven't seen Andre in a year. I mentioned this event, and the first thing out of her mouth is that that little conversation I told you. It was like, is, is Peter Sagal secretly a hunk? Is he secretly ripped? I go, I don't know. Word on the street, dude, is that you are a bit of a closet Adonis. I feel that the best thing I can do in response to that is merely to maintain some mystery. <laughs> well... You know, Chris, it's the world of radio, and I think it's so important that everybody have their own image of who I am. So I don't want to spoil that by, for example, standing up right now. I think I will just leave that to your imagination. Uh, no, I, as I say in my book, um, I, I come from a long line of, of stocky Jews, and uh, my running career, as unexpected as it was, ain't going to do nothing about that. So uh, no, I'm, I, I hate to disappoint. Uh, I, I think, let me put it this way. People meet me and they ask me occasionally if they don't know who I am, what I do. And I say, I host a public radio show. No one at that point expresses surprise. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Nobody says, a, a, a guy like you, I thought you were clearly a magazine cover model. No, they say, oh, that makes sense. You seem, you yeah. seem like... You seem like the person, you look like the kind of person who would host a public radio show. Well, I wonder if that didn't come about, that whole sort of rumor come about because people start to suspect there's got to be some hottie at NPR, you know? It can't oh, there are there are hotties at NPR. Uh, our, Ari Shapiro is so beautiful to look at, uh, it, it hurts my eyes. He's, yeah. he's perfect. Huh. I mean, he's, it's almost creepy. He's like He's like one of those weird computer generated images of, of like the perfect human male. He's, it's just terrifying. And I have no idea what he's doing in my business with a man that good looking. I would have said Corey Flintoff. There's something in Corey Flintoff. Oh, Corey Flintoff is a handsome man. He's sort of more to the, he, he's sort of like the cool uncle type look rather than the, okay. rather than the matinee idol, which is all Ari. I think his languid tone is kind of like, yep, got it all happening right here. Yeah. The, the, but the funny thing in this, uh, I, I know people have this experience with me. People are probably experiencing it right now. If you've never happened to see me, people on radio, people who you know through radio never look like what you expect. It's just the image you have. And so what I've discovered is that people don't hear the first four or five minutes of whatever I'm saying because they just can't get over the fact that the voice is coming out of this face. <laughs> and for those of you who are disappointed, imagine how I feel. And uh, do you, do you get, do you, again, we're about the same age. Do you remember a guy in NPR named Noah Adams? Maybe the name. 
Noah was one of the original hosts of All Things Considered, a, a real, uh, if you can be a celebrity in public radio, he was one at NPR News. And he had this incredibly deep, warm voice that I found extremely comforting. I've always felt that if somebody had to tell me I was terminally ill and would die in a month, just get Noah to tell me and it would be all right. And I always imagined him as sort of this large Bur Burl Ives type guy because he had that resonance, right? And I imagined this big beefy guy, maybe he had to wear belts and suspenders, he had a beard. And I met him and the guy was 5'1 and 100 pounds soaking wet. And as, as uh, Ray Suarez said to me, he said, yeah, Noah's got a problem every spring. People want to stand them up and put them in their gardens. <laughs> uh, and so I, and, and I literally had the experience. I'm talking to him about something of interest to both of us. And I have no idea what he said because I'm just staring at him going, this cannot be. So right. if anybody out there is feeling that way about me, I, I, I understand. Yeah. Well, this is great, Peter. Like you say, you know, I've been kind of uh, a fan and an admirer for a long time. And again, and, and almost every time I listen to you, I don't know why I keep waiting for you to like to drop an F bomb or say something wrong. And I don't understand how a guy who is as rapid fire as you are, and I almost dropped an F bomb myself. Never, never. Um, F well, here's a, here's a funny thing. Um, first of all, our show is edited. Yeah, it sounds live uh, as your wife who came to see us live in Philadelphia knows a lot of stuff gets said that nobody hears on the radio, at least. And so that's one of the reasons why you never hear me say anything. The other thing I have learned is um, that for public radio people, especially um, swearing is almost like a superpower or maybe more analogous. It's like if you ever played a video game, maybe where you you, you as your hero have like a weapon that you can use once. So you have to remember to use it at the key moment of danger, otherwise you'll waste it. And so if I were to drop an F-bomb, I mean, let me just put it this way. Whenever I do it, people go fucking nuts. <laughs> and then I can escape or whatever. So, you know, if everything, if, but seriously, if things are like dying, if something has happened that is like completely distracted the audience and like something, to, I just, I just say, uh, I just say fuck and the audience is like, whoa, you did that. Oh, and we forget whatever disaster preceded. It's a little trick I've learned. It seems so tawdry to me now. I know. Hey, uh, I have a, I have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, first of all, how's Sherman? I'm sure everybody asks you that, but everybody who reads the book wants to know. So how's Sherman? You know, Sherman's doing great, but it's bizarre. I can give you. A, I'll try to condense the answer as much as possible. But you know, we had a weird thing happen uh, in the early days of COVID last year. You know, where we live in Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania almost all of our contiguous neighbors are Amish or Mennonite, and most of them don't drive, they don't use phones, and they sure as heck are not mask wearers. And so we had a sort of crisis moment where I thought, man, I really don't wanna be in a house 30 miles from a hospital heated by wood if me or my wife gets really sick. And we're the only people around here that can actually drive anyone to the hospital. So like, like that, in six weeks, we decided let's rehome the animals, sell the farm, and move back to Mika's home in Hawaii. Wow, dude, it was wow, a pure like pulling the ripcord on a fighter jet and ejecting like that. And there was kind of a stunned look in my family's face. And I said, We, we just got to do this. And uh, I just kind of barreled ahead with it. And every step I thought was going to be the roadblock, which was going to prevent it, and yeah. nothing. And the first and toughest thing, the thing the whole thing hinged on is do we have a safe home for all the animals, right? The donkeys, because the donkeys are a package deal. They're like uh, conjoined triplets now. Those three have to be together. I think I speak for all your readers when I say, we know. Yeah, yeah. And to the point where it still kind of surprises me, you don't move one without the other two suddenly like ears up on the alert. Right. So we called uh, a friend who's a farrier, Leslie, and said, hey, Leslie, by chance, do you know anybody who can take three donkeys? And she went, this guy. I'll take them. She has a 150 acre farm with five other donkeys. And so what we thought was going to be a difficult transition for Sherman, the donkeys actually became a full on massive upgrade for them. You know, they went from our little five acre farm in Peach Bottom to 150 acres in Westchester with a professional, basically vet tech at their 24 seven disposal. So that's where Sherman is right now, living his great life. And all the other, the, the sheep went to my daughter's best friend. The goats went to uh, a neighbor and the cats, the four cats went to an Amish guy that I write about, Amos King, the uh, the runner, 
took the four cats into his family. So and, and do you have any animals in your new home in Hawaii? Yeah, immediately. So there's a, there was a 14 day mandatory, mandatory quarantine when sure. you arrived. And the nanosecond that my wife and daughter were released from quarantine, they went directly to a cat cafe. Have you ever been to one of these things? Yes, I have. <laughs> okay. We'll get on to that in a second. I want to hear your story, but the Humane Society brings cats into this cafe and they just kind of run amok. And anybody who is, does not have a heart of stone will uh, adopt one of those cats and bring it home. So we have a kitten uh, nick, uh, named after um, uh, Kitty of Monsters, Inc. Of course. And so we have a kitty named Kitty right now in Hawaii. The, I, I have to, this is a personal, per, point of personal privilege. You write in Running with Sherman about all the animals, this menagerie you have. You don't seem to have any dogs. What is wrong with you? Why don't you have a dog? Yeah, you, you're a full-on dog guy. I'm huh? a dog guy. Here's my thing about dogs. Dogs are high maintenance, man. Um, all compared, of, compared to donkeys? Donkeys, all you really got to do is fence them and walk away. They're kind of a turnkey animal because they feed themselves. There's water nearby. You only got to walk them. You don't got to pick up their droppings, uh, which for a donkey would be formidable. It would be. You know, dogs kind of, you got to contain them. You got to look at them. They're always jumping on stuff. So I, I know I'm... I'm kind of shoot myself in the foot with a massive dog population but and i've had this conversation with alexander horowitz if you haven't read her books peter oh, i have yeah she's awesome she's awesome in every in every way uh yeah so i don't know i'm just not a dog dude i'll take a cat any day they, they like to run you know you may have heard that dogs yeah, and i've had some fun with that but i feel like you know an uncle you know with a kid like yeah. a nephew, yeah, like, you want to give him back i understand here's your dog see you tomorrow uh, i understand i understand yeah. Uh, this is this is a perhaps a slightly more complicated question. Uh, how are the Tara? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna completely. I practice. I'm gonna butcher it. The Tara Humara. Very the, good. Is that good? Did I do it right? Because I I was one of the I, literally millions of people who read Born to Run and uh, was inspired by it and amazed by it. But I, I wonder what it did to them in terms of like a tremendous amount of attention being brought to them and their their home. We well, you know it's an interesting thing because you know recently in particular there's there's been sort of pushback and criticism of the attention uh, that's come to the Tarahumara because yeah. of Born to Run. And I, I never really understood that. You know, the stated mission from Caballo Blanco from the beginning right. was here's a group that is under extreme threat and they're being ignored. They are a group in the recesses of the Copper Canyon who are not being protected by their government. And they are easy pickings for the drug cartels and the bandits that, that live down there. And his vision all along was, let's create this race in the middle of nowhere. And rather than the Tarumata being pulled out of the canyons to be sort of display creatures as they have in the past, these guys are the champs, you know, and the champs get the home court. Let's bring runners down here. And I think beyond his wildest dreams, that, that succeeded. He created this race. Uh, it became a great story or a really interesting story. And it uh, mushroomed into this great race experience down in Rike, which has brought runners down, you know, year after year. So I don't understand, you know, maybe I'm missing something, but to me, the more attention they get, the better. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I had no preconception of what the answer was. I just assumed that their life must have changed based on the global success of your book about them. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it has it it changed because of the book. I think they really are under severe threat particularly from the cartels that dominate sure. the area and i don't think much has been done to help protect them right um what's your running life now especially since you moved to hawaii you know it's funny uh because i have read and i first of all was a huge fan of your runner's world series forever and oh yeah that was a lot of fun i came in kind of skeptically because i had no knowledge of you as a runner at all and I thought, look at Runner's World, just pulling in a celebrity, you know, just pulling in, you know, the blue chipper to write, but he doesn't really know anything. And then week after week, I learned two things. One is you had these really iconoclastic thoughts and insights into running that I wasn't seeing anywhere else because most, and I, you know, I'll take a, a, a kick at Runner's World, most of the articles, the same thing over and over and over again. Over and over. How many things can you say about running? He said to one of the best-selling authors ever about running. Well, uh, yeah, but I think luckily, I think that's the reason why I, I admired you so much was because week after week you took this questioning humor. And here's the other thing. Here's here's basically what it comes down to, Peter. It seemed like you were having fun, 
and almost every article about running makes it seem like it sucks. And this is a guy that's having a good time. Well, I, I, maybe people will be interested because it's also what led to my book. So uh, back in 2007, I got I qualified for the Boston Marathon. Notice how I slid that in there. <laughs> and um, I was there and I met the editor of Runner's World at the time. And they put me on like this panel of like first time Boston runners. And uh, they did an interview with me and I complained half joking that one of the disadvantages of running as opposed to many other sports and hobbies is there's not enough shit to buy, right? Because we're men and we know that one of the great things about any hobby is buying the equipment, right? Yeah. You know, and all the other hobbies, you know, even bicycling, you get to buy this cool stuff and think about it and obsess about it and waste money and argue with your spouse. Running, what do you got? You got your shirt, you got your shorts, you got your shoes, you're done. And so he said, would you like to be our gear columnist? And I was like, sure. So <laughs> for a little while, every two months, I'd get a box and there'd be some running gadget of some kind, be it a strap on bottle or maybe some compression socks. And I would write more or less the same column. It was like, well, I got to try these compression socks and, and, uh, and you know, they're fine, but I don't really think they'll make you run any better because they're just socks. And apparently that was not the <laughs> best attitude to take in a magazine supported by advertising from people who make running equipment. Uh, in fact, my last column as the gear columnist was about a Nike product and no ex-CIA agent has ever gone through the kind of vetting for his <laughs> publication that I did with my column about Nike for Runner's World. So they said, does anything else you want to write about? And I was like, oh, I'll just think of something. And every two months, because I was every other month, I'd say, what the hell am I going to write about? It's running. And I always said, you'll know when I get to you know, the great debate, left, right, left, or right, left, right. <laughs> then you'll know I'm out of ideas. But every time I had to think of something, I, I would meet somebody. I would uh, hear about some kind of race or participate in it. And there was always a story to tell. And I, I mean, why am I telling Chris McDougall this? That it's not the running per se that's interesting. It's the people who run and why and uh, what they get out of it and how they came to it. For example, one of the columns that I'm most proud of uh, that because it ended up with me knowing the guy was about this guy who also ran Boston in 2007 named Jacob Seelheimer. And Jacob, I found out was running because he didn't qualify. He weighed 400 pounds and he put up a website and he said, I'm running the Boston Marathon. You know, you can follow me here. And I was really kind of annoyed by him because I had worked really hard to um, qualify. And the idea of this such a beast guy just saying, I'm gonna run the Boston Marathon. It's like, no, no, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta suffer for it like I do, Don. And I was gonna write this column basically saying, this guy is wrong and you shouldn't do that. And it's dangerous to go from morbidly obese to running a marathon. And, but if I'm gonna write about him, I gotta call him up, you know, basic ethics, right? So I called him up and I talked to him and he was this actually amazing guy who, as we all do, had his own struggles and didn't mean to end up weighing 400 pounds and didn't expect that, but ended up there. It turns out that he had been talked into it by his friends who were worried that he was gonna die if they didn't do something for him. And he didn't wanna disappoint his friends. So he did it and he lost a hundred pounds. It took him, I don't know how many hours to run the Boston Marathon. He finished way after dark, long after the course had been taken down. But it ended up changing his life and bringing him joy and was part of his journey. And uh, he ended up, I think, being like one of the bravest and best runners I've ever met because, you know, it's one thing when you've been training and you show up wearing the appropriate spandex. It's another thing if you're a 400 pound guy who's never done it before. And that was him. So it was always, as I said, the people who I found out there on the roads and trails to write about that made it possible. Don't you hate it when facts get in the way of a good story? I know. I was so ready to completely trash this guy. I ended up being uh, just, just an absolute sweetheart and kind of an example to me of, of grit and determination. And then uh, he's, I write about him in my book, too, because as it turns out, by the time I had contacted him, and this was about six or seven years ago, uh, he had been diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is a very terrible brain tumor. Uh, and he had lived with it for eight years, heroically, uh, before he finally succumbed, I want to say, two years ago. Uh, but I got to meet him. I got to know him. And I got to know his wife. And they're both amazing people. And that's, you know, that's sort of why you do it for the people you meet out there. Well, Peter, you know, it brings up someone else you wrote about, too. And 
I want to state this right because it's going to sound dumb, um, but that's an occupational hazard with I me. Understand. But the blind runner that you guided, yeah, the takeaway I got from that to me was very, very akin to us running with the donkeys. And the reason why I, I'm wondering if he'll enjoy that comparison, but go on, please. I felt like I was walking into the furnace here, but I want to forge ahead. Now, now he, he would actually, William is a great guy and has a sense of humor and would very much enjoy it. And he will enjoy it when I mentioned to him that you said that, but go on. Yeah, you know, cautiously I'm treading here, but the reason <laughs> why is because, you know, the wonderful takeaway from that was that as I was reading, I was like, oh yeah, this is the same thing. The reason why is you're a guy who has trained hard to run very fast for very long distances. And there's not a lot of margin for error when you're trying to qualify for Boston and to adjust anything to accommodate somebody else can be a massive pain in the ass. And you did it with somebody else. But to me, there was that swallowing of personal pace and ambition and discharging and getting out of the way that made it so much more gratifying. Like it transformed the act of running. And to me, that's what happened with running with the donkeys is with once you just say, hey, dude, it's not about you for five minutes. You you really feel so energized and uplifted. Uh, am I on, on target with this? No, you are. And I think, I mean, not only uh, I think you're right. I think that you've also established the appeal of not just, you know, uh, running with Sherman, which is right there. I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 I mean, you know, one potential subtitle of running with Sherman is, as they say in dog circles, who saved who. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, that's obviously the theme of your book, not only Sherman, but Zeke and other people in the book who appear in various levels of, 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 of centeredness who have been saved or are saving themselves through running. The, your story about the, am I getting this right? The Pedretti family. Yeah. Who show up in Colorado and Leadville uh, every, every year to honor their, their lost sibling and son is, was powerful. Um, and, you know, one of the things I went through, and it's what you write about, is, you know, you do this thing, this, this sport of running, which most people think of as a solitary thing, and it can be, and it's kind of solipsistic, you know. I mean, it's not a team sport. You're not doing it to win a championship. Uh, you're not doing it to bomb with your team. You're doing it for yourself. And people talk about it when they talk about running. Uh, they talk about, you know, the benefits to the self. You lose weight, you get cheer up. I mean, your, your, your case is that it is, a, a, if not a cure, certainly an aid for depression, I think is very strong. Um, certainly true in my case. But it is all about yourself. You know, you're out there, you're doing it for yourself. And what I found in my experience of guiding William, I've done it four times now and hope to do it again, is when you find a way to do it for someone else, or in your case, something else, uh, an animal, it becomes so much more important. And, and what was, and I say this in my book and, and what I've written and said about William is that was the easiest marathon I ever ran because it was the only marathon I ever ran where I, well, other than the other times I've guided, where I wasn't thinking about myself at all, you know, and yeah. I wasn't engaging in that constant, you know, am I doing well? Am I getting my targets? You know, you have the, the paces for the mile written on your wrist. Like, I didn't care about any of that. Like, I'm going to get this guy to the finish line. And that is a better way to walk through life or to run a marathon than to be thinking about your own benefit. And it's something I've wrestled with because I've become firmly convinced that the communal aspect of running, this is really uh, embodied beginning with, with the Tarahumata. They always run as a group. This idea of one person putting in an air, an air, what do you call them, air buds and activating Strava and then going off on their own is ludicrous to the Tarahumata. They always run as a group, like a cross country team. And again and again, even the original persistence hunters who ran down, you know, antelope in the savannah did it as a group. You can't go out by yourself and catch a, an antelope. You need a, a bunch of dudes. And so I'm convinced that running in sync with other people is the way to go. And yet I fail at it more often than not. You know, most of the time is grab my own 45 minutes. So it's something I'm, I'm really wrestling with. How, how about you? Well, no, as a matter of fact, uh, in my book, um, I, I do a chapter on like, so you want to start running and you don't know how, you've never done it, you don't think you can. And I give three, um, uh, a couple pieces of advice, which are some people are resistant. And one of them, uh, you've mentioned both actually, one of them is to run with a group. Again, people think of it as a solitary thing. People are also used to thinking of exercise as something you schedule in your day, you sleep, you eat, you exercise, you work. You don't think of it as a social activity. It's just part of your routine. Um, you can hit the gym, whatever. No, run with people. 
it's 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 better you'll do better because you're going to be responsible to somebody else to show up at a certain time and run a certain distance when for yourself you'd probably say ah, i feel tired today no if everybody agreed you're going to meet at the corner of elm and maine and go run 10 miles you'll be there because you don't want to let people down and it's also as you say i mean we're social animals we like to be with other people and i have found in my life that running with people uh, is a great way to spend time with them. You get to know them, you get to talk, you get to share something. There's nothing at stake. You're not dating. You're not discussing a business deal. Your relationship may last as long as this run. You may be again, and it's great. And as you know, nobody has to care about how they look because you all look bad. <laughs> uh, but the, you know what? The hardest thing to get people to buy into is to take the earphones out, which you also mentioned. Yeah. Um, I'm like, when you go for a run, especially if you're with a group, obviously, but even if you're by yourself, take the earphones out. And people are like, I can't do it, man. It's like too long. It's boring. I can't, you know, half an hour. I can't just be out there running. What am I going to think about? It's like, well, and what I say to people is the way that we live our lives now, right now we're all staring at screens. I'm staring at a screen. Everybody watching this is by definition staring at a screen. You probably spent all day staring at a screen. Chances are that if you were away from a screen for any significant period of time, you were listening to something or maybe have or something in the background, maybe music or more likely a podcast if you want for you to walk, walk your dog or your donkey. Um, and you'll and when we were all done tonight and you've enjoyed this evening with us, uh, you might watch a movie. I'm pointing at my room where the TV is. Maybe yours is in a different direction and you'll watch another screen. We are living our lives in which we do not spend more than 30, 40 seconds sometimes without somebody else's thoughts that we are importing into our heads, be it a TV show, a podcast, this event. You gotta, you gotta spend some time in your own head just to find out what's there. And, um, and I think it's really important. So my advice to everybody, and I'm, one of the things I want to get out from you before we finish this, is to find out what your advice is, is to first time runners. But my advice is take out the headphones, go out, run what you're going to run based on your schedule, where you are, but just be in your own head and see what it's like. You'd be surprised what's been lurking under there. You haven't given yourself a chance to hear because you've been drowning it out. Well, you know, something you reminded me, this is taking the advice in their opposite direction for a moment. But tonight, when you do watch something, go on. I think it's on Vimeo. Have you seen the documentary called Beer Runners? No, but I've done a beer run. Okay. This is a different thing entirely. You've done a beer mile, I guess. Beer mile. Beer mile. Yes, exactly. The beer runners. Uh, they're the Fishtown Beer Runners. This is a group. I, just watch the film. But um, this is a group that began for people who didn't think they were good enough to be runners. And they figure, hey, we're not good enough as runners, but we're damn good drinkers. Right. And so they go, let's just find a bar. It's about a mile from the house and just run to the bar. And once we get there, we'll reward ourselves with a beer. And then the bar they kept choosing was a little bit further. There you go, further away. But what it, it did was it, it destigmatized the whole thing. Because you know what happens when you tell people that you started running? You're instantly peppered with qualifiers like, well, you train for a marathon? What's your best 10K? You know, they start to sort of challenge you. I, I hear it all the time. I actually did a little TED talk where some dude like fronted me on my way to the stage. He goes, hey, I think we're about the same age, right? We're in the same age category. What's your best 10K? Now, do you mind if I just give this talk and then I'll get right back to you? But it was so important to him to find out where he stood, you know, in a hierarchy. And right. that, that was the problem. For him, it was about competition and not camaraderie. And to me, like that's the key thing right there if you can forget about turning your recreation into another form of work yes there's a form of play yes you good at it you can suck at it because it doesn't matter but I, i'm putting this out to you uh peter and everybody else find that documentary beer runners i guarantee you, tears will be strickling down your cheeks it's fantastic but it really embodies exactly what we're going for uh I, i'm gonna qualify this uh I, I, everything you said is true but one of the things i also say to people uh, many years ago, I was running um, in Austin, Texas, and there was a guy in Austin whose name I can't remember who ran uh, the Texas, Austin, Texas running story. He's a big running guru in the area uh, since closed, and he trained like George W. Bush uh, and Michael Dell to go running. And uh, he was talking about his programs, and he said, we don't do exercise. Exercise is a chore. We help athletes train, and training is a pleasure. And I was like, that's pretty good. 
So what I advise people, if they're starting from zero, from the, you know, the paradigmatic uh, couch, is I say, pick a goal, pick a 10K, excuse me, or maybe a 5K. And as everybody knows, there's lots of couch to 5K programs. Because I think that we're all good at, there are a lot of people who tell themselves, I'm bad at exercise, I'm not athletic, I can't stick to it, I hate it, I give it up. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to you, oh, I tried and I hated it, I gave it up. But one thing that everybody is really good at is they're really good at achieving goals because we've all done it, right? We've all studied for an exam or finished a project at work or painted the outhouse or whatever it is. Everybody has that part of their brain where they know how to plan something, execute it, and take pleasure in the execution. So I say, go run a race, you know? Go say, all right, in three months or eight months or however long, I'm going to go run the local community 5K. And you train to that and you don't have to win it. And you're not going to win it but you're gonna finish it and you're gonna finish it and it's gonna be something that you did not think you could have accomplished when you started, when you set out to accomplish it. And I, I think that's really important. I will donate another hundred dollars to the San Francisco Public Library if Peter Sagal in fact paints an outhouse. I have painted an outhouse, my friend. <laughs> I'm up to I'd be happy to do it again. If anybody has an outhouse <laughs> that's convenient to me that needs painting i will be happy to come paint your outhouse experience required um here's the thing too peter so you know i write a lot about my friend barefoot ted in born to run yes. and i'm using the, the term um my friend because at the time of born and run the guy was driving me insane i couldn't stand him and it's the point of like you know i, I could just feel my my neck throbbing whenever i heard his voice but I noticed that other people really seemed to like him. So I had to kind of circle back and interview everybody else we were down there with to find out why do you like this guy and he's driving me crazy. But over the years, I've really come to genuinely like him and love him a lot. But I still have this cycle where he'll say something, I'll roll my eyes, make fun of him behind his back, mock him, and then six months later, I'm talking about it like I came up with it myself. And one of his things is you know, he's trained for Leadville, he's run Leadville. He's run Leadville in like 24 hours, which is astonishingly fast. And his training is nothing, dude. You do more in three days than he does in a month. And uh, his secret, he says, is I'm not interested in the limits of what's possible. I'm interested in the limits of what's pleasurable. And I thought, all right, dude, you know, that is an aphorism for the ages. When he runs, he always leaves something in the tank. He goes out. And at the point where it's just no longer fun, he just stops walks away and goes home, but it leaves him eager to get back on the hamster wheel the next day. You mentioned this in the context, I think you're talking about a young woman in Running with Sherman who was a short distance runner, 800s maybe, and then transitioned to running long with donkeys. And um, one of the things you say, and I just read it the other day, so I'm, I'll be close to you say like, you know, the whole idea of a short distance run, a sprinter, middle distance, is to suffer as much as you can in order to achieve your goal. That's the suffering is part of the achievement. I mean, there's, a, there's an aphorism about the, the, the mile. The ideal mile race is one where you lose consciousness just on the other side of the finish line, right? Yeah. And one of the major revelations for my sort of running career, such as it was, such as it is, is the discovery that, that that's not true, that you're not, you don't train to endure suffering. That's not the point. If there's a point of training, it's to get to the place where you can do what you want to do, be it run a distance, run a certain distance in a time, or just make it around, you know, the block and back and not suffer and, and do it with ease and pleasure. So I'm, I'm all, I'm, even though I, I'm, a, I'm a still proud wearer of uh, running shoes, I'm a big fan of Barefoot Ted, at least in that aspect, I think he's exactly right. Well, believe it or not, this brings us full circle to what the original question was um, about two hours ago when we started this, this yes. conversation which was, how's my running going these days? And beautiful in one sense. So when Eric Orton first started to train me, you know, when this whole adventure with Born to Run started, I was not a runner. I was always hurt. It just seemed like needless suffering and pain. And when this guy started training me up from uh, point zero, he said, what are your goals? And I started talking about this 50 mile race. He's like, no, no, not the race. What's your goals? What kind of runner do you want to be? And my answer was, I just want to be able to go out the door and go as far as I feel like on any given day. And he's like, that's the good goal. And that's basically where it's left me now. So it's been 2004 when I first started this whole thing, uh, trying to get back into running again. And that's kind of where it's left me now. Um, years later, I feel like I can walk out the door. If I'm feeling good. I'll go 10. If I feel like crap, I'll do two. But I just feel um, 
tuned up and ready. Like I've been given this great gift of uh, recreation and mobility and I can just play with it as long as I want. Yeah, and you have a beautiful place to play with it. Yeah, that's sort of where I am. My, my fast marathon days are behind me, but it is a pleasure to just get outside, especially during this pandemic. It was sometimes the only days, I, only time of the day I was outside was when I went for a run. It's like right. psychologically yeah. essential. Um, I know Matthew, I think, this is when you were gonna bring us questions from the audience, Matthew. Am I right about that? Yes, and we do have some questions that I think are gonna be perfect. Uh, so great segue, thank you. Uh, there is a question here about uh, cross training. Wondering if either of you fellows do any biking or lifting or swimming. And I have to uh, just start off by saying that I know that Chris has done knife throwing in the past, uh, parkour. I actually thought that was going to be the next book. And then Natural Born Heroes came out and it took me by surprise. So uh, the audience would like to know what kind of cross training either of you might do or maybe even cross writing um you're writing articles and also books so uh, take it away yeah peter uh i love to ride my bike i own five of them i make up for the lack of equipment to buy and running by buying too many bicycles uh and i love it and some days i think i, I think of uh, every now and then you hear about a runner who whose knees go out and they end up just biking maniacally and i think that wouldn't be so bad i do enjoy it a lot um although i'm not doing anything fast these days I have over the years tried various different kinds of exercise. I've had a yoga period. I've had a Pilates period. I've had a lifting period. Um, and I've always enjoyed it. I like exercise. Uh, you would know it from looking at me, but I enjoy being physically active. Uh, but I, I've never successfully, with the exception of biking, never stuck with anything except running. Um, and I guess that says something about me. Uh, so you know, that, so the, the short answer is yes, I do a lot of other things, but I always come back to running and always begin to feel terrible if I don't run. Yeah, running's my go-to. Uh, it's just so easy. But, you know, it's funny, aside this experience, um, a few years back, it was like shortly after Born to Run came out, and I was invited up to Harvard to speak at uh, some kind of like a symposium. And there are going to be three people on stage. It's going to be me, uh, Daniel Lieberman, the evolutionary yep. biologist who... Uh, uh, created the born to run hypothesis and a guy named Dr. John Rady, who's a psychiatrist at Harvard medical school. And the three of us were basically going to talk about the correlation between uh, exercise and mental health and Rady's special uh, specialty is attention deficiency. So we're in like in a green room and I come barreling. I was a little bit late and I was really hungry and there's food there. And so I hop in, I grab some food and I say hi to some people. And I finally get a chance to meet Dr. John Rady. And as we're talking, he kind of pats me on the shoulder. And he's like, yeah, I, get, I imagine school must have really been a torture for you, you know, because of your ADHD. I'm like, dude, I'm not the ADHD. And he kind of gives me this like kind of consoling look like, oh, yeah, you are. And he goes, I, I watched you come to this room. You almost knocked over the president of Harvard. You grabbed three things. You're talking with your mouth full of food. You know, you said hi to seven people. You don't know any of their names. You're bouncing around here like a Super Bowl. And at first, I was like indignant at this, you know, this rapid fire diagnosis. But at the same time, I had this like six sense moment. Like, oh, suddenly everything, you know, makes perfect sense. And what I've been doing, like, I've really been kind of embracing that, you know, that feeling like, oh, like, that's the reason why I'm always running around. Like, I'm just all hypercharged and hyperactive. And so I've given sort of full throttle to that. And so what I do now is like whatever crosses my mind, no matter how stupid it might be, like knife throwing body surfing. I started playing pickup basketball again, even though I broke my hand the first time I started playing again. And I'm taking on board that advice of like, you don't have to be good at it because it's just a game. So what I've been doing now is basically playing as much. As a matter of fact, I just finished a basketball game. This thing is actually soaked in sweat because I just play pickup ball with a bunch of high school kids who I'm sure are smirking <laughs> back at this moment. But that's what I'm doing. As much as I can play and keep it playful, that's what I go for. Sure. Another thing you and I have in common, by the way. Yeah. Well, our audience is also wondering what you guys are working on now. Um, so maybe we'll start with Chris. Uh, we have you as a captive audience. I feel like it would be uh, a crime not to ask. And Peter, I'm curious as well if there's an incomplete, incomplete book of running yeah. in the wings. So Chris, what projects are you working on now? So I'm working on a book and Peter probably feels the same way. Like you don't want to kind of give too much tongue time to what you're working on because you start to get sick of it. But what I'm looking at is exactly this topic we were talking about. Um, 
this idea of camaraderie versus competition and um, became friendly with two guys who are best friends and yet have these diametrically opposed approaches to competition. So I'm basically looking at their saga, but also folding in lots of other people. I know a woman who is a uh, champion, um, last man standing ultra runner, and she's also a trauma nurse in Las Vegas. Like you gotta be the busiest trauma nurse in the world is in Las Vegas. And she finishes like 40 consecutive hours of work and then goes out and then runs, you know, through the Tetons for hours at a time. And so that's basically what I'm looking at is that I'm basically trying to challenge, you know, David Goggins has a super popular book called, you know, Can't Kill Me. And I, I read it. And as much as I admire him and genuinely like him, I just feel like the message is so wrong. You know, this idea that if you don't finish the race in the ER, you know, you didn't do it honestly. And, and I think it, that's not the right way. So that's, that's basically what I'm scratching at right now. Uh, I'd say this, I, I, I feel like I've had to say what I had to say about running. Uh, I, I mean, after 10 years of writing for runner's world and then, and then this book. So, and I have this day job. And so when I'm thinking about these other projects, it's usually about things that I don't get to talk about in my day job. So for example, I did a documentary for PBS about the constitution, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I've got a couple of ideas. I've started to write for magazines again, which is something I used to do never in the level of Chris, but always enjoyed and started doing that again uh, for some small, for, for a magazine out here in Chicago. Uh, right now I'm in the middle of writing a profile of a friend of mine actually uh, uh, in that uh, it's nice to write about your friends. I will say that to meet people that you want to write about in doing so. A guy named Jason Benetti who is um, the play-by-play -play announcer for the Chicago White Sox. Oh. And an amazing guy and a great soul and also has cerebral palsy and has risen to the top of his profession as a, as a, as a, as a sports broadcaster. And he's a fascinating guy. And it's, you know, one of, the, one of the nice things about writing, and journalists will tell you this, serious ones, is that if you're a journalist or a nonfiction writer of any kind, you get to spend time in other people's worlds as opposed to remaining in yours. So I, I have a lot of fun with that. And I've got some other projects, none of which I'm ready to talk about, which will be hopefully, hopefully, hopefully coming to fruition soon. We'll see how it happens. You can I like that's a very professional tease. Are you doing food writing, Peter? I have, in fact, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm even in a food, I, 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 I'm, I'm even in a food anthology about Midwestern food writing. I've written, about, I've written about food. I've done travel writing from time to time. Uh, I've used to write plays, of course. That was my original choice of a career. Um, I've done essays. I've done all kinds of things. Yeah, I think I've read some of your food writing. It's kind of lingers. Uh, and I, I don't know why. I can't think of any in particular. For some reason, maybe the Chicago hot dog or something kind of, I associate that with. I, 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 have, I, I am extremely, uh, I, I am a proud advocate for all Chicago food. Yeah. Other than deep dish pizza. In fact, my whole point is deep dish pizza is a waste of a meal because there's so many better things to eat in Chicago, but we can go on about that okay. some other time. Are there more questions, Matthew? Because I got yeah, more. For we, have, uh, we have another question, but I'm going to actually add to it uh, because I've so enjoyed the idea of, uh, of, of this not being about running, but about people and the idea of just getting out there and doing it, not necessarily to achieve a time, but to achieve a good feeling. And I'm thinking about the generosity of both of you guys doing this for the friends of the San Francisco Public Library. And uh, we're wondering, the audience has a question about your relationship to libraries. The add-on is, I wonder if I could convince you guys to come to San Francisco and do a branch library run with me, <laughs> where we would run from branch to branch, and I'm sure I could arrange for some beer at the end of it, and even a hot dog. Um, but but your relationship with libraries, please. Chris, I think it's your turn to go first. Yeah, I'm actually eager to, uh, if you know, my, well, first of all, I will give a qualified hell yeah to the branch to branch run, because my brother and awesome niece and nephew are in San Mateo. So if I can get out there, and I can haul them along. So that'd be so fun, man. It'd be so cool. So if we can make it work, let's keep the conversation going. I'm all for it. But for me, um, yeah, you know, I look back on the stuff we did. Peter, you probably the same thing. Like the stuff you did when you're nine. Now, I look back and I'm like, why were my parents not arrested? Like, why was I not in protective custody? Because when I was nine years old, I used to travel. And I even clocked it. It was four and a half miles from my house to Upper Darby Public Library. And I would leave in the morning and take the bus and go to the library on my own, like nine, 10 years old. 
hang out in the library all day, check out a sack full of books. And that was my summer back and forth to Upper Darby Public Library. And then what I was reading was unrestricted. I actually bought another copy of a book called Life Plus 99 Years. It was the autobiography of one of the, um, oh man, what was that murder thing in the 1920s? Uh, the stuff in my mind, uh, the, the two. The, Leopold and Loeb? Leopold and Loeb, yeah. So Nathan Leopold wrote, it's a great, it's a great book, by the way, Peter, uh, wrote a memoir. I get it. I read it when I was nine years old by a convicted murderer justifying his crime. And it, it stayed with me so long that 30 years later, I'm like, yeah, I got to read that again and, and bought a vintage copy. So um, clearly there is a very short direct line from A to B between hanging out in Upper Darby Public Library as a juvenile delinquent and everything that happened uh, career-wise since then. Uh, it's more or less the same for me, except it was Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, not far as the crow flies. Uh, I was, I have this very vivid memory and I've written about it elsewhere. The Berkeley Heights Public Library uh, had two levels. The kids books were on the bottom level and the adult books were on the top. And I just, I have this memory of like the day I just got bored with whatever they had downstairs in terms of picture books and chapter books, which I have, you know, read many, many, many of them as a young boy and just walking up those stairs into the world of adult books. And, uh, and it was like, you know, walking into the chocolate room in Willy Wonka or stepping out into Oz. It was like perhaps the most significant stairway I've ever walked in my life because that's shaped my life. I mean, look where I'm sitting. This is my office. It's basically a library. Uh, of my own books, which I have hauled around with me. I'm sure you've done the same thing. Um, wherever, in all the various homes I've lived in, and I've lived in a lot of homes. So yeah, in fact, one of the things, one of, uh, parenthetically, one of the complaints that I've got about modern life is that I have somehow lost the habit of constantly reading because there's so many other distractions, right? When somebody might've tweeted something, I get to put down the book. And I've been very much trying to get back to that. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's just so, you know, these things aren't merely decoration. And when I, when I finally get back to reading, it's, 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 I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like, I guess the best way to put it is when I can't run um, whatever, I start getting antsy and unhappy. And then when I finally get out and go for a run, it's like, oh, everything is the way it should be. That's how it feels to be getting back to reading books on a regular basis. So yes, yeah. libraries are very important to me. I would not be doing this if we were benefiting say, oh, I don't know, a gas station. Hey, uh, hey, Matthew, I love the fact that nature has conspired to do a, a, gen a gentle fade out for me. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the same thing. It's like when I'm listening to NPR and the music comes on and you know that that should be about the end of the interview. So I think that that's our cue to, cool. uh, for, for me to say uh, just a, 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 I have a deep gratitude uh, for you guys. I have been just a Twitter in terms of excited uh, to be a part of the conversation, just to uh, be, a, be a listener to a conversation between the two of you. It was a dream of mine to think about getting you in the same room together. Uh, and so uh, thank you for doing this virtually and, and maybe we pass it back over to Marie for some closing uh, comments. Marie's on mute. Technology. Okay. Yeah. That, thank you so much. And the uh, branch run is happening no matter what. We will be in touch. We'll organize it. You know, as our branches begin to open up again after COVID, you know, we're, we're going to have a year of the branch and we will be in touch. And I am not a runner. This was very encouraging to me. Um, I was a competitive swimmer and uh, some of, a lot of the stuff you said is really resonating and one thing that's sort of registering for me is the moment in training when it went from pain to training at 80% and understanding that that was, that was a really good thing in order to perform later. And just the idea that you don't have to be miserable and make yourself miserable. Although I, I did struggle with, with running, but I'm willing to run to the bar. And if we organize the branch run, we'll have beer at every site and maybe that'll make it a whole lot more fun. But thank you guys so much. And thank you to people who made donations. Uh, please uh, visit our website, support your own library support organization in your town. It is so important. The only thing that is almost left that is free, public, shared, and is completely de uh, dedicated to the equity and inclusion of everyone is your public library. 
we support these institutions and we thank you so much, Peter and Chris for just the, the fun talk. And thank you, Matthew, for, for spearheading this. And we will see you back in town when we have our run. All right. All right. Okay, thank, thank you all you so much. much. Chris, it's a real pleasure to watch you in the sunset in Hawaii. And hopefully we'll meet, uh, we'll he's meet. In, uh, we'll he's not, he's in somewhere. Pennsylvania right now. At the moment, I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. oh, wait a minute. How long are you going to be there? Yeah, so it's a curious thing. We made our daughter a reckless promise that, hey, if a vaccine should come along and it's safe, we will take you back to Lancaster to finish your junior year of high school. Lo and behold, Pfizer came rolling out with his vaccine, so I had to come good on the promise. So now my wife and I are actually tag teaming back and forth, spending like two months at a time in Pennsylvania. Well, if, if you and or she or and or both of you and or your daughters are there on August 5th, uh, Wait, Wait is going to do its first show in front of an actual audience wow. at the Man Center. We are coming out of hiding uh, oh. August 5th at, uh, in Philly. Come oh. as my guest. It'd be great to see you. Unfortunately, that is when I'm heading back. I'm heading back. To where I know. I know. I know. Well, as maybe send your wife. She's more impressive anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. You.